Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the first Kitab talk in our spring 2021 series featuring Hazine. Um, we're so thrilled to have uh, several of the co-editors here for a roundtable discussion. And um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Emma Harver, and I am the Director of Outreach for the Duke UNC Consortium for Middle East Studies. And the Kitab Talk series is a collaboration between the Center for Middle East and Islamic Studies at UNC Chapel Hill and the UNC University Libraries. And in our COVID times, this program has gone online. And so we're thrilled that people from around the country and around the world can join us for the various resources, uh, digital, digital opportunities that we can showcase um, for researching the Middle East and beyond through this series. So without further ado, I will hand it over to my colleague, Rustin Zarkar, who is the Librarian for Middle East and Islamic Studies at UNC Chapel Hill. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Emma, for the very kind introduction. Um, I, this is an amazing turnout. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Um, and um, I'm so happy to introduce our um, our guest today, which is the Hazina team. For those of you who are unfamiliar with, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Hazina if you're here, but um, Hazina is a wonderful website that um, it builds itself as a guide to researching the Middle East and beyond. Um, it uh, publishes some fantastic archive reviews, interviews, long form essays, and resource guides. And today um, uh, the editors will be discussing their work. And so I just wanna take the time to introduce the editors and uh, then we will begin the discussion. So the editors in chiefs are Heather Hughes and uh, Nadira Mansour. And uh, we also have the art subject editor Marwa Gadala and also the manuscript subject editor Shabir Ava Abbas. So this is a round table format. Um, generally, they'll be presenting their, uh, um, you know, their presentations. And then uh, afterwards, we'll leave some time for Q&A. So um, feel free to, um, once the Q&A is beginning, uh, has begun, uh, feel free to either raise your hand in the chat or you can, you can, you can raise your hand and uh, present you know, uh, by speaking or you can uh, type in your question in the chat. So um, without further ado, I guess um, I'll leave it to uh, Heather Hughes, who is the editor in chief, one of the editors in chief. So uh, please, Heather, um, the floor is yours. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having us today, Rustin um, and Emma. It's a, a wonderful series to be a part of. Um, we're really excited to share this virtual space uh, with you all. It's nice to see familiar uh, names in the, in the participants. Um, before we get started on our um, presentation, uh, we thought it'd be nice to have a little bit of an overview of the site. Uh, for folks who maybe haven't used it extensively or, or aren't familiar yet. So um, I'm going to quickly show, show our site. So um, Hazina, a guide to researching the Middle East and beyond. Uh, we've got our menu here, which uh, shows the main categories of pieces that we publish. So, so um, we've got archives reviews, and then these are kind of divided uh, geographically. Um, we've also got, ooh, sorry, <laughs> the libraries. Um, and then we've got essays, which is kind of a more uh, open format. Uh, we've got essays that cover different topics related to research, cultural heritage, archives, um, what have you. Um, and then our resources uh, pay list kind of shows, um, ooh, sorry, the website keeps kind of jumping around. Um, shows some uh, like longer lists of, that show things that we like, such as blogs, um, podcasts, and then also like more detailed guides to using specific tools. Um, and let's see. Um, and then we've also, one category we have is interviews. Uh, we've interviewed a number of like librarians and then also cultural heritage workers. Um, and then under about, um, there's information about how to donate to Hazina. Um, that's something that we recently started doing in order to pay our expenses and also to pay our writers is, um, is fundraising. Um, and you can also find our submission guidelines in case you're wondering, in case you're thinking about um, submitting something and wondering how should you format it. Um, but you, there's also, um, you could also look at other pieces to see how those are set up as well. Um, and then there's also information about our contributors um, and things like that. Um, 
this is kind of a new feature on our site. We've got a button for Arabic. Um, so you can uh, check out our Arabic content there. Um, and we're really excited about being able to reach a wider audience. Um, and so hopefully, let's see, hopefully this is pretty straightforward in terms of finding content, but you can also do a keyword search in our site. And then we've also got a number of tags on the side. And then you can also see like what our most read popular uh, posts at the moment are. Um, and like, like to also encourage you to subscribe to us uh, if you haven't already, uh, you can get um, updates on our content that way. And then we've also got a very uh, robust social media presence. I wanna particularly give a shout out to uh, Nadira for making our, our Twitter so engaging, uh, but our, you can also follow us on Facebook. We share our content as well as other resources that we think will be of interest to um, to our wider community and also share resources that, that we're excited about. Um, okay, so from there, I'm gonna go into our presentation. So let's see, present. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about my involvement and my work with Hazina as one of the editors. Um, so let's see, oh dear, okay. Um, I joined this in 2016, um, where when it was um, at that point under the leadership of Nir Shafir and Chris Markovitz, the two Ottoman historians who, who launched Hazina. And uh, one of the things that I was interested in for Hazina is bringing a bit more library invol worker involvement into the site in terms of providing content. At the time, we were it was largely made up of archives reviews from researchers who had gone out into the field and were then reporting back on um, repositories and resources that might be less well known about or have a less robust um, web presence. So I was thinking it would be nice to hear more from librarians about their collections that they're working with, um, but also as a way to kind of highlight their work more because I think that um, like library and archivist work um, is very much structuring research, but it's not always very apparent or visible to researchers. Um, so I wanted to kind of make that more visible and also think, but also I believe that that in and of itself makes, um, makes researchers better researchers. Um, and one of the ways we've done that is kind of soliciting pieces from librarians, but also like interviewing them and hearing about their work. So that's been really fun. Um, and I think it's been nice too to not just, we're not just interested in like some kinds of work like collection development or um, outreach, but also like cataloging. So we interviewed someone who, um, Kat, Kelly Tuttle, who um, is the manuscript cataloger for the manuscripts of the Muslim World Project. Um, and we've also been able to expand that to other cultural heritage workers. So um, I would encourage you to check that out. Um, you haven't already, um, but we're, we're also interested too in kind of engaging with critical librarianship and archival theory, um, recognizing that libraries have, and cultural heritage institutions have participated in racism and colonialism, and thinking about how that also connects with these dynamics in the area studies that we're engaged with. Um, and another side of that too is the fact that um, a lot of times scholars working on on um, archives and working on archival endeavors aren't, aren't always engaging with archival scholarship and archival practitioners too. So um, we have a wonderful piece from Sumaya Ahmed on our site that addresses that topic. Um, so I we're really wanting to be a bit of a meeting place between Middle East studies and also then the library and information studies. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about is um, Hazina as a publishing platform. Um, so a little bit going beyond archives reviews. Um, although I, I wanna emphasize that the archives reviews in and of themselves are wonderful pieces that um, often showcase really creative writing and I, um, I absolutely love reading them. <laughs> uh, but we've also started including more kind of creative pieces that also address research and cultural heritage in some way. And uh, we've been able to find those pieces through a variety of ways. And sometimes it's people coming to us where they're not quite sure where to bring a piece. And sometimes it's us seeking out pieces or 
you know, seeing a, a well-formed thread on Twitter that's like halfway towards becoming an article. So kind of approaching people about that and asking if they're interested in publishing. Um, so I think it's been, it's been fun to think about research um, in different contexts beyond like specific institutions. Um, we've also been interested in like diversifying our content. Um, and so our, our tagline of the guide to researching the Middle East and beyond, I think we're really trying to go, go beyond um, and feature more geographic areas, uh, more linguistic areas um, and different groups of people. So um, one area that we recently were able to publish on is we had an archives guide to Kurdish resources and that had a really good reception. And I think that that filled a, filled a need that was out there. So um, we definitely wanna think about power dynamics within Middle Eastern studies and not necessarily replicate them. So, um, and not just, you know, a lot of times people are coming to us, but we don't just wanna wait for people to come to us with specific ideas. We wanna also uh, represent different, different topics. Um, and another thing we've been able to do is put out some specific calls targeting unique um, areas that we'd like to feature more of. Um, so we had, um, we, re we now have one up about music that I hope folks might consider um, might consider um, submitting for. And it's, it's basically a call for scholars, musicians, collectors, folks who are kind of working with uh, music as a source to, um, to write about that. So I'm hoping, looking forward to seeing what people put forth. And I'll pass it on to my colleague, Shabir. For those of you who are unaware, uh, Shabir is the uh, manuscript subject editor for Hazina, and uh, he'll be talking a little bit more about uh, manuscripts. Um, thank you to uh, Rostin and everyone at UNC who graciously invited our team to talk about Hazine. I wanted to kindly uh, first preface my few words by mentioning that I had dental surgery just yesterday, so I asked for your kindness and allowing me to be a little more brief than the others. I will also be reading my presentation in order to compensate for the after effects of the surgery. When it comes to my involvement uh, in Khazine, I joined Nadira, Heather, and Marwa last year as an editor. In my role, I focus on manuscripts, and as manuscripts are physical items, as they are material culture, we cannot separate manuscripts from the physical repositories that they are found in, nor can we separate them from the humans who work on cataloging, preserving, ultimately maintaining these manuscripts. So main concern of mine is raising awareness as to the different repositories in the Islamicate world, especially those that might be overlooked due to conflict. In doing this, I try to share information as to traveling to these places. Likewise, building connections with the important personnel at these locations and bringing att attention to their efforts is something I try to do. For example, in the past year, I have tried to shed light on some of the important repositories concerning Shi is Islam, Shiism. I wrote an archive review on the Al-Imam Al-Hakim Public Library in Najaf, Iraq, and I currently am writing an archive review on the Central Library of Astan Quds Razavi in Mashhad, Iran. These libraries are critically important as to their manuscript collections, but as they're located in countries where either there is ongoing war or there are political tensions, they tend to be ignored. Both these institutions in some fashion can be traced back several centuries. While the Al-Hakim library may seem modern, it is an amalgamation of several private collections of the ancient seminary of Najaf. Whereas Astan Quds Razavi as an institution can be traced back to the Ilkhanid period and the complex itself to the Abbas period. As good academics, as good researchers, we cannot afford to ignore important work that is being done. So I try my best to reduce the distance between humans be it geographical distance or distance caused by politics. You can change the slide. Thank you. In the world of manuscripts, there are a lot of great people whose work and experiences can be a source of inspiration and benefit. For example, in the summer of 2009, I was in Cairo and I had to perform some manuscript research at Dar Kutub. In this process, I befriended Dr. Walid Ghali, the current head librarian at the Aga Khan Library in London. He began his career as a mere 15 year old kid in Egypt. Shocked at the disregard for manuscripts by a neighbor of his was destroying them. In response, he dedicated his career to manuscripts, 
working diligently from the bottom up, cataloging manuscripts at different repositories within Egypt, making a name for himself. The work was hard and tedious, but he is at where he's at today because of that journey. These types of stories I try to locate and include in Hazine in the form of interviews. Every repository has someone like Walid Ghali that we can benefit from. Behind every manuscript, there are numerous human stories involved from its provenance to its acquisition to its cataloging. I feel Hazine could very well serve as that platform to host these human stories. So, in, so interested researchers could know who to connect with in Iran and Iraq, in Egypt or in South Asia. These modern boundaries in the Islamic world while physically enforced are intellectually and culturally artificial. Our heritage is shared. Manuscripts serve as the living memory of humanity as a collective. And as long as humans exist, we must not be forcefully divided. So if anyone would ever like to collaborate with Khazine, especially when it comes to manuscripts, please reach out to me and the rest of the team. If you've done research at a repository and want to share your experiences in the form of an archive review, we are happy to host it. Once again, thank you to Rastin and all at UNC for having us. Thanks. Thank you so much, Shabir. Um, I really appreciate your presentation. Um, so next up, we have uh, Marwa Gadala, who's the um, the art subject editor. So uh, Marwa, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Rastin, and uh, um, for inviting us. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm the arts editor here at Hazana, and I joined last year, early last year, after having worked on a piece, on another piece with Nedra and I ended up joining. Um, I'm gonna be talking about um, how we're trying to use Hazana to create, um, to create a platform for artistic discourse. So I think it's important to begin by noting that um, the discourse an artist uses while they're creating artwork um, has an influence on how an audience, how the audience receives the artwork and whether it'll be suitable for a particular audience. So, um, and sometimes that discourse even in influences who the, who the audience is going to be. So one of the things that we're interested in is um, discussing the issues of employing Western artistic sensibilities in art that's created for a non-Western audience, particularly because that audience comes from a background that does not necessarily identify with Western sensibilities. Um, we recently published a piece on typographic matchmaking um, and how Latin sensibilities associated with type design being applied while creating a font or a typeface for the Arabic um, can make it can render it irrelevant for you know uh, anyone who uses the Arabic script, whether they're Arabic speakers or anyone who you know the Arabic script is a native you know is a significant part of their you know uh, their lives. So um, that's like one of the things that we had recently published about. Uh, and um, we're also keen on interviewing artists and practitioners from regions that aren't necessarily perceived to have created an impact in the artistic field. Um, particularly um, artists and practitioners from places like the Mashaq, the Maghrib, Iran, um, Africa, uh, to sort of highlight how um, how they've been trying to serve the communities through the art that they're creating based on the knowledge that they have of their communities from living in those communities. Um, we've also late, recently released um, a call for pitches. Um, the, the, the theme of this call for pitches was basically how artists or the significance of art in the digital sphere. So how digital media have influenced how art is practiced today and has consumed. So we didn't just um, get, uh, we're not just interested for this, for this call to pitches. We, um, we have artists writing, but we also have consumers because it's really important to see how people from various, um, from various communities receive artwork and how it influences them. And it's important to note here that um, we're trying to highlight that there is expertise in these areas. 
and that um, a lot of the work done here is backed up by um, you know, good research and um, a knowledge of the subject. So we have, we, so we're currently having, we currently have writers from, Tun from Tunis, Egypt, Iran, the Gulf. Uh, I think something important to say here is that um, I, I mentioned that um, we're trying to interview and, you know, create a space for artists and practitioners who aren't necessarily perceived to have created an impact. Um, I think the important thing to note here is that it's not about giving those um, artists and consumers a voice because they already have that. It's about giving them a platform for expression. It's about showing that, you know, um, basically, you know, when you're, uh, it's about showing that they need to be heard. It's not that they don't have something to say. It's that we just, it's like, for instance, when you're, when you're, when you're in a room and someone's talking, but you decide not to listen, for instance, um, because you're not interested. So, so the idea here is to like show that um, it's not about um, getting, it's not about telling them what to say or giving them a chance or wanting them to say something in particular, but just giving them that chance to like express themselves, uh, gi giving them the, the platform to have a bigger audience. Uh, moving forward, something that we're interested in doing is creating a platform, um, not just where issues are discussed, but also where we can pose potential solutions and solutions to um, the issues that we raise. Um, and, but uh, from, from people and the communities that we're interested in. So basically, um, we wouldn't pose the solutions ourselves, but we'd also um, encourage uh, people from the communities that we're that we're looking at to come up with those solutions because they're more aware of their communities. Um, okay, then next. Um, in line with our interest in, uh, in art, we're also interested in using art ourselves on the platform, on our platform on Hazina. Um, we're trying to appear, appeal, this is still new, we're still starting this out. We're trying to appeal to another type of learner, the visual learner, not just the reader. Um, because the visual, particularly um, media like comics and editorial illustration has the capability of, you know, addressing ideas and concepts that are uh, from in a way that's a bit different from the written word. Um, and sometimes they can be used as in the case of editorial illustration to support the written word. So these are just two scenes from a comic that's yet to come out. Um, this is on open access. It's basically about, um, we're discussing how, what we know about open access, the definitions that we become so accustomed to and whether there's a problem with those definitions and um, seeing how uh, like we can address them. This is a reflection comic and it's yet to come out soon, inshallah. Um, yeah, the next scene. Uh, the other thing uh, we're also working on right now is our vigil identity. So what we're trying to do for our vigil identity is um, employ uh, vigil aspects of the culture that we're interested in on the site. So obviously one of the things that we're interested in is um, the Arab world. These are uh, Kufic compositions. Uh, it's a, this is a type of Kufic script called the Kufic Qayrawani. It was developed um, in, early, in the early years of Al-Hijra. Um, it, was, it, was, it was developed originally in Qayrawan, in the city of Qayrawan in Tunis. We don't have very many manuscripts displaying this uh, script. We only have like a few. Uh, the reason why I'm displaying this is because um, this is the inspiration for our visual identity. It's still being worked on. So basically this is Khazina written in Arabic uh, without the dots. Um, as you can see here, the first line is it, the first the first one is is written in the Kufi Qayrawani that was on the previous scene. Um, the second one is based on ar archaic Kufic, but it's more rounded and um, it's been worked on a bit. The last one is actually has actually been developed recently. It's called Al Qandus. It, it was 
It, it's a script that was developed in uh, the 19th century by a calligrapher named Al Kandusi. So it's called Al Kandusi script. As you can see, it's interesting because he plays with, you know, if you can see the temarbuta at the end of the hemarbuta, the last letter, it has an interesting shape to it, um, interesting counterform. So these are basically to show how we've been trying to employ, um, you know, the, how we've been trying to employ, you know, that historical aspect of, you know, the culture that we're interested in, in our visual identity. These are obviously, we're still working on that. We're still working on it, but these are just examples of what we've been um, doing. And yeah, and of course we're always open to, um, you know, if anyone's ever interested in writing about, you know, anything related has a has an, has something. If anyone has anything to write about um, associated with art, anything. We're currently, for instance, developing our site in the sense of that we're trying to talk more about calligraphy and typography, and um, and illustration, hopefully moving forward. So if anyone's ever interested, we're definitely always open to people sending us. And yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Marwa. So next up we have uh, Nadira, who is the other co-editor for Hazina. So uh, Nadira, please, the floor is yours. So first off, um, so I'm one of the editors in chief. Um, my name is Nadira Mansour and my pen name is N.A. Mansour. Um, First off, I wanna point out that Marwa wrote the article on typographic matchmaking, which she referred to very humbly. Um, you'll be receiving some, a link to a Google doc in the chat and her article was linked in there. So um, yeah, uh, I guess I can begin with how to think of the website because we have been transitioning. And a friend recently asked when I was trying to get him to write for me, he said, you know, like what makes this so different than, you know, other sites? Like what's the linchpin? Like what's going to hold this all together? And I told him, you know, I think elements of this is, I'm sort of obsessed with knowledge and how it's produced. And that's sort of an interesting framing for it. So like how, if, if an archive represents one way of thinking about knowledge in this organization, can we think about other ways? Um, so, uh yeah um sorry i'm just rusting is texting me that my video is not going to be able to start so i apologize okay so um i think also as we expand the site obviously we're trying to think about regions and how we incorporate them and i think those of us who work on the region um the quote unquote region and on these all these other regions on the islamic world on the muslim world on the mushroom the Muslim, east africa west africa north africa um we're trying to think of all the ways in which these worlds intersect, right? So um, if we're trying to think of the ways in which these worlds intersect, then we have to begin to sort of grapple with these terms, but also bringing that sort of content online. Um, and that's sort of the task I think for the next few years is how to think about ways in which we incorporate content um, and ways in which we can represent those voices. Uh, another thing I think we're aiming at doing is filling gaps. So one gap obviously is in education. Um, I think that many a grad student has come to me and has said, you know, I don't know about these online resources. It's really disheartening to see master students, graduate students, PhD students. Um, if it's really disheartening to see them sort of enter the field and not realize so much of the materials online, not understand how to use a catalog, not understand the differences between different standards. Um, so we're trying to fill that gap. That's, <laughs> I don't even know if that's the gap I'm really interested in filling all the time. I think that, I think that there are ways in which, which the site can be seen as a hand servant to academia and I'm, I'm simply just not interested in that anymore. I'm not really interested in, in serving the academic community as much as I am individual communities. Um, and I think, and the ways in which as I referenced earlier, we overlap and the ways in which we can support each other and also different systems of knowledge. I mean, I reference sort of again, different cataloging standards. The reason you have to be familiar with them is you need to be able to tear them down. And there are some excellent people doing that work 
And most of them are in the places in which these histories are based. So listening to those people, learning from them and consulting them as Marwa so eloquently spoke about um, is, is part of the mission right now. I think that academia has done real damage I think it is neo-colonial, neo-imperial. Neo I'm not the first person to say that. I won't be the last person to say that. Um, so I think the approach we're taking is community-based. And a lot of that is reaching out to people and saying, well, what do you need and what do you want? Like, what, what can we offer you? And Heather referenced a piece that was recently written for us by Bahadin Kerkurani um, on Kurdish online resources. That should be linked in the Google Doc that will be in the chat. Um, it's also one of the most recent pieces on the site, so you can just go to the site and scroll down. Um, Rustine, if you want to scroll down and find it, you can, you can show everyone it. Um, and I think part of it was, I'd asked him, what, what would you like to write? He's someone who knows his community deeply. He um, recognized, he understands sort of the parameters of it, and he, he built this beautiful piece. And, and I know people will say, well, why isn't everything done neatly and organized, and why, like, does this not look like your other resource list? He did something that made sense for him. And the same can be said of, we have a list on Afghanistan that was written by the brilliant Munaza Ibtikar. And it was the same thing of just sort of like her thinking about what her community needed. Um, and I, I mean, both of those pieces were very well received by those communities specifically, not necessarily just by academics. Again, the priority is making sure that people know how to access their own histories and how to challenge those hierarchies. Um, and I think to that end, we're becoming more of a public humanity site. Um, I think we are extremely, extremely lucky right now because we've got really good peers um, and they've been extremely supportive. Uh, so you've got Contingent Magazine, brilliant. They've been, they've, they've sat down with me and walked us through sort of fundraising issues and like how to like find merch and like different issues with web publishing. Um, Arab Lit, um, so Marshall Links Quayley, who is here today, uh, has been a brilliant friend and just thinking through these issues. And if there's anyone who's embedded in a community, it's her. She is, she's incredible. Mashallah. Um, and then, of course, the Maidan, um, Ahmed Tekeliolu and his team, um, Micah Hughes, too. I think they've been tremendously supportive, but they're also a good intellectual partner to think through some of these issues. Um, Lama, um, the Journal for Libyan Studies with Open Access, is another really great platform. Egypt Migrations, um, which was formerly the CCHP, the Coptic Canadian History Project. Um, those should be in the doc that will be in the chat. Those are all linked. And please support them financially if you can. Um, another issue that has been brought up is translation. And I really, again, have to give credit to Marwa here because she's been my sort of intellectual partner in all of this. And um, just again, Rustine, you're doing a great job sort of choreographing this. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so with Arabic, me and Marwa have spoken about this and Marwa has presented at like conferences on this. So she's thought really deeply about this with me and she's a great partner. Um, is you can translate material, that's great. It's more accessible, especially because so many different digital projects think that transliteration is enough. Like you really think an Arabic speaker is gonna have access to that? Um, sorry, it's a bit of a sore point, especially right now. Um, but what we're trying to do with the Arabic stuff right now as we translate material is thinking, okay, what, what sitting down talking to people and saying, how can we direct you to sources that exist? How can we build little hacks in for sources that are more accessible? I mean, there's only one really great photo archive that's in Arabic, that's Hakkesa. Um, and it, it works really well. They worked really hard on the data. Um, so we're trying, we work with a translator on our content. So it's thought at random of metalingual translations is brilliant, but we're also trying to develop original Arabic content. Um, so I guess there's two more things I can speak to and, and people can ask questions. Um, if you're interested in writing to us, our email is linked in the Google Doc. It's just hazineblog at gmail.com. Um, and also, I mean, I'm sort of in charge of the website and also thinking the physical website and thinking and like working with like the plugins and things like that. I can also speak to different elements of web publishing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I spend a lot of time talking to other publishers uh, and 
like talking through like what works for you and they've been extremely supportive i think it's it's just a thing of great comfort that perhaps like the americanists and the diplomatic historians have been the most supportive because they have great developed like public history projects and where our goals don't align with theirs islamic studies middle east studies etc have very different needs from the public humanities discourse um they're very willing to sit down and talk to me um and yeah, finances. I mean, if anyone wants to ask questions about fundraising, um, yeah, go ahead. But I just want to thank again, Emma and Rustine. You guys have been brilliant, especially since we seem to be having technical issues. And we do take donations. Thank you, Rustine. Um, and if you want to donate to us, go ahead. We will be launching a fundraising campaign too. But again, please donate to Contingent, Arab Lit, and lots of other causes. Um, I think we're we're fairly happy that we can pay our writers now. It's 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 really fun, and also we have a series starting on Monday on inclusive pedagogy. So look out for that. And yeah. Well, um, I just want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, for uh, Emma Harbor for uh, organizing and taking care of the 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 technological aspects, and as a partner in the Kitab Talk. Uh, for Hazine, uh, the team for coming out and giving this fantastic presentation. And uh, it really left us with a lot to, to think about and ways to kind of think about our own work as librarians, as scholars, as archivists. So I really appreciate it. And um, once again, this was part of our uh, Kitab Talk series. Um, we have put in links for um, the others in our spring lineup, which includes Jasmine uh, Suleiman and also uh, Michael Erdman. So uh, if you're interested, please sign up for those. Well, we can also continue the conversations that we're having here in the other talks. Like it would be nice to have like a nice uh, rolling community that we can kind of uh, come together and uh, talk about these really important issues. So um, thank you so much for coming. Um, and we hope you uh, are, we see you again. <laughs>